Welcome back. Tonight, from the author of Every Third House, Marjorie Frisby, a short story she wrote some decades ago that was never published, based on a newspaper story she read, The Boy Who Saw Lincoln Shot, by Marjorie Frisby. Chapter 1. Long years ago, when Abraham Lincoln was President of the United States, Joe Hazelton lived so close to Lincoln's house in Washington that he could have walked there for lunch. Actually, he never did go to the White House for lunch, but he did visit there. Joe's house was on E Street, number 376. His room was on the top floor. From his bed, he could hear a lot of what went on in the street below. Today, on April 14th, 1865, Joe lay in his warm bed until he was wide awake. He listened for street noises to tell him what was happening outside. If today was going to be as exciting as yesterday, he couldn't wait to get started living it. Just half as exciting would be great, Joe thought. He had no idea, as he finally rolled out of bed, that this day would be in school books as long as there was the United States of America. Two men Joe knew were going to make history that day. One of them was President Lincoln. Joe's toes sent shivery signals from the cold floorboards up his back as he moved towards the window. What was going on in the street? What if he was missing something? It used to be, while the war was going on, that people acted like they were going to a funeral every day in Washington. Now that the war had stopped, they'd got their smiles out again. They grinned at each other and acted in ways Joe thought were kind of goofy. Strangers hailed strangers on the street. Others just shouted for joy. Some people brought out pans to bang against each other. The noise was unbelievable. It made Joe think of pop exploding out of a bottle that was shaken before it was opened. Everything in town clattered and clanged and gushed. Yesterday, church bells had pealed all day. You'd guess it was people celebrating Holy Thursday because it was Holy Week. Really, they were reacting to General, General Robert E. Lee's surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia to General Grant. Even now, in the early morning, you could hear cannons boom and smell gunpowder. People were trying to say, wow, the war is over, as loud as they could. Not everyone had the use of a cannon. A lot of people simply tied tin cans to sticks and waved them in the air. Up close, these zing-zingers were almost as loud as the church bells. To Joe, even the bells swinging from the cow's necks rang out at the end of the war. And the flags. They were everywhere. Where there weren't real flags, there was bunting, dyed red, white and blue, hanging from windows. Some people looped big pieces of red cloth along the sills. Joe was amazed at people's antics on the streets. Some of them were doing daft things like riding their mules backwards. They waved the mule's tails at passers-by. Joe decided that being happy made people silly. Some athletic guys climbed up lampposts and waved their arms and yelled. Other people went around hugging folk. Joe saw little kids skipping instead of walking. What would Joe see today? He turned his toe head one way and then the other. His wide eyes swept the street. Nothing remarkable yet to go down and tell his mother about. That would come later. There was no way Joe could tell before breakfast that that Good Friday in 1865 would change the course of his life. It would change the life of the country. Like everyone else waking up in Washington that April 14th, 1865, Joe thought bad times had ended. Pretty soon the rest of the Southern generals would have to surrender. The South had lost the war between the states. Things should get better. Things would have got better if it weren't for the terrible surprise awaiting the country at the popular Ford's Theatre at 10th and E Streets, where Joe worked. In the fall of 1864, Joe had gone to Ford's Theatre to apply for a job as programme boy. Harry Ford, whose brother owned the theatre, worked there as a manager. He was nice to Joe the way he was nice to everyone. He could see how much the 12-year-old wanted the job. Well, Joseph, he said, anyone, anyone who wants a job as badly as you seem to want this one should have it. Tomorrow would be a good day for you to begin. Tomorrow? How could Joe get ready that fast? 
He needed time to brush his good clothes. He had to wash his light blonde hair and make sure it wasn't sticking up in places. He was nervous about looking right. He really wanted the job. Ford's theatre seemed the right place for Joe. He liked meeting people, and a lot of people, important people in Washington, came to Ford's theatre. Senators, representatives, member of, members of the cabinet, the people who gave the president advice. Joe's favourite of the regular theatre-goers was President Lincoln himself. He felt close to the president because he'd been to his office once. The president had given Joe some good advice. Actually, Joe was one of the few kids in Washington who had met the president, talked to him and held his hand. It happened this way. Joe's Uncle Frederick knew President Lincoln. He also knew how much Joe admired the president. One of these days when I go to the White House, he promised Joe, I'm going to take you along. Uncle Fred wasn't just saying that. He meant it. Joe could hardly believe his luck the day his dream of meeting President Lincoln came true. Joe took off along Pennsylvania Avenue with his uncle as if he were walking on air instead of cobblestones. His eyes widened as the sentry at the White House saluted his uncle Frederick and presented arms. Joe's uncle was a brigadier general. Inside the White House, Joe and his uncle were ushered into President Lincoln's office. The president stood with one hand resting on the back of his chair. He reached out to Brigadier General Frederick E. Foster with the other. Joe looked up at the tall, gaunt and stooped figure. He couldn't believe how close he was standing to the president of the United States. Later on, Joe wouldn't be able to remember a thing about the room the president was standing in. But he never forgot his thin face, his dark eyes, the gentle ruefulness of his smile. He saw that the president's clothes hung like clothes on a scarecrow. The president was so thin, his friends called him Spindle Shanks. President Lincoln was only 56, but he looked old and sick. Suffering with his people had wearied him. After he greeted the general, President Lincoln returned to Joseph. Mr. President, General Foster said, this is a young kinsman of mine than whom I believe you have no sincerer admirer. He gently pushed Joe forward towards the president. Joe bravely held out his hand. The president wrapped Joe's small hand in his two large palms and smiled at him. His smile lit up his face like a candle from within. Joe thought that looking into President Lincoln's eyes, he could see into his soul. Joe had expected to be like a mouse under the chair, seen but not heard. But President Lincoln paid attention to children. He had a way with them. He liked them, and they liked him. Even though General Foster had bought war information, the President didn't mind keeping him waiting a minute while he talked to Joe. The President seemed focused on Joe as if there was nothing else on his mind. Joseph, he said gravely, I am glad to form your acquaintance, and I trust I will always deserve your regard. Even then, the President did not turn from Joe's admiring gaze. And you are employed at Ford's Theatre, Joseph, he asked. That is interesting. I trust it will not interfere with your schooling or your rest. Theatres make for long hours. Joseph assured the President that his mother was very careful about the hours he kept. The President nodded thoughtfully. Give her no cause for anxiety, Joseph. The mothers of this world bear too much of the world's sadness, and we must do what we can to lighten that. Joe nodded. The President had one more question. And what are your plans for the future? Will you adopt the stage? By this time, all three had taken seats. The President crossed one long leg over his knee. He went on to say that he thought Joseph had the elements of a good voice. You might do worse than try the stage. A great profession that can be made of good service. Think about it, Joseph. Think well of the stage. Only then did the President of the United States turn to General Foster and his news of the war. Joe sat there, too overwhelmed to speak or move. Inside his head, he kept hearing President Lincoln's voice talking to him. The President cared what he did when he grew up. The President thought he had a good voice. Joe couldn't wait to go home and tell his mother about this good adventure. Chapter 2 
As he walked along Pennsylvania Avenue beside Uncle Fred, Joe wondered whether the president would remember him the next time he came to Ford's theatre. The president did. From then on, each time Mr Lincoln came to the theatre, he hailed Joe by name as he took his programme. Sometimes Mrs Lincoln would smile at Joseph. Often the presidential couple would arrive late and be the last to take programmes. As soon as they passed by, Joe would look around for any other latecomers. Then he'd follow the Lincolns into the theatre. He always got goosebumps when the orchestra played Hail to the Chief, his chief. Sometimes Joe pretended that he was acting on the stage with the president watching him. Hadn't the president praised his voice? And the president wasn't the only one. An actor he'd met at the theatre, a very good actor, Joe thought, often urged Joe to think about a career before the footlights. His name was John Wilkes Booth. Booth wasn't part of the regular company at Ford Theatre. He was a jobber. He accepted only the roles he thought fit his great talent. Booth liked to stand in front of the theatre, twirling his moustache, calling attention to himself. He thought he was special. Even though he didn't look up to John Wilkes Booth the way he looked up to President Lincoln, Joe listened to him. Booth was like a sparkler, a lot of flash and then disappointment. You never knew what he would do or what he would say, but you felt more alive when he was around. Booth looked down on other actors, even though many of his relatives were on the stage. Joe heard him say that there are not a half a dozen really good players in America and less than a score in Europe. Actors call themselves, forsooth, poof. They know little, think less and understand next to nothing. One day, Joe ran into John Wilkes Booth on 10th Avenue near Pennsylvania Avenue. The actor laid his hand on Joe's shoulder and inspected the boy's cap. Is that your best? he asked. Joe said it was. Mr Booth shook his head. It pleases me not at all. Come with me and we will find another. Keeping his hand on Joe's shoulder, he steered the boy into a shop on E Street. Fit my young friend here with a cap more befitting his professional duties, he told the clerk. One who makes known the players of great parts should be surmounted with a proper crown. Joe was very pleased to have a new cap. But his mother pursed her lips. She made Joe promise he would not accept any more presents without asking her first. Later on, when Mr Booth wanted to buy Joe a new cravat, a kind of tie, his mother said no. She did not approve. Mr Booth gave Joe advice as well as caps. You have the face of an actor, he told Joe. The features of a young Byron. He was referring to Lord Byron, the famous poet, who was considered very handsome. Mr Booth admitted to Joe that acting was a hard life, but the world will think better of the actor some day, he told Joe, and treat him more liberally. When Joe thought about Booth in later years, he always linked him to William Shakespeare. Booth often declaimed lines from Shakespeare. One day, Joe met Booth coming out of a saloon. He was shouting some of Cassius' lines from Julius Caesar. Come to the common pulpits and cry out, liberty, freedom and enfranchisement. Joseph knew something about Julius Caesar and about Cassius from hanging around the theatre. Cassius, a Roman general, led a group of Roman senators who assassinated their ruler, Julius Caesar. He did it in real life and Mr Shakespeare wrote a play about it. Another day, Mr Booth told Joseph that Cassius symbolises eternal justice. Joe wondered how Booth can say that when Cassius was an assassin. At first, Joe found Mr Booth an exciting companion. Gradually, he got the feeling Booth was all mixed up. How could Booth praise someone like Cassius and find fault with President Lincoln? How could he blame Lincoln for the war and rant so much about the South's humiliation? It was all he ever talked about. Booth's anger made Joe uneasy. But he didn't think of John Wilkes Booth as dangerous. If anyone had told Joe that John Wilkes Booth was planning to kill the President of the United States on March 15th, Joe would not have believed him or her. March 15th, the Ides of March. This was the same day that Booth's hero Cassius and his friends killed Julius Caesar, long ago in Rome. Even though March 15th passed and nothing happened, it was true. 
if Booth and his friends had been able to get ready in time, they'd have tried to kill President Lincoln on the Ides of March. But they had to postpone their attempt until the Friday in Holy Week. Good Friday was the day Jesus died. That was the day Joe Hazelton woke up so happy. Good Friday, April 14th, 1865. Chapter 3 That Good Friday evening, President Lincoln had two reasons for going to the Ford's Theatre. First, the owner, Mr John T. Ford himself, had especially invited the Lincolns to a performance of Our American Cousin. Second, Mrs Lincoln had had her heart set on seeing Laura Keane in her last performance in the play. This immensely pleased Harry Ford, the man who had hired Joe. He got his workmen to decorate the special box seats where President and Mrs Lincoln would sit. The war is practically over, Harry Ford told the men putting silk flags around the picture of George Washington. General Sherman should clean up Johnson in the South and then everything will be better. This night is really a peace celebration. When Harry Ford saw Joe watching, he said, Be here in plenty of time, Joseph. Joe considered hanging around, but then he decided to go home for supper. He could get back in plenty of time. Before he left, Joe met John Wilkes Booth coming out of the theatre in the long black frock coat he wore to hide his bow legs. Booth didn't have a part in Our American Cousin, but Joe wasn't surprised to see him. Booth was in and out of Ford's Theatre all the time. He was familiar with all the entries and exits. He knew how to get in and out of the boxes. He knew where each passageway led. Besides, his mail was delivered there. Mr Booth smiled at Joe and patted him on the shoulder in a friendly way. Well, Joseph, have you made your mind up to be an actor? He asked casually. Joe said he didn't know. Maybe I wouldn't do it for the stage. Try it, Joseph, when the time comes, Booth advised. Then he said abruptly, We've been good friends, Joseph, eh? Well, try and think well of me, and this will buy you a stick of candy. This was the last word John Wilkes Booth ever said to Joseph. He handed him a piece of paper money called a shin plaster, worth about ten cents, and took off. Joseph would see Booth, Booth for the last tragic time that very night. Both of Joseph's friends, Mr Booth and Mr Lincoln, had long busy days that Good Friday. While Booth was picking up his mail at the theatre that morning, he heard that the Lincolns would attend the performance that night. Booth sneaked up to the President's box. First he checked to see if the locks on the door were still broken. They were. Booth looked around to see if anyone was watching him. Then he bored a peephole right in the door. Next to it he dug a niche in the plastered wall. He caught the bits of plaster with his handkerchief so no one would find them and wonder what was going on. Next, Booth hired a horse for four o'clock. He promised the poor utility boy, Johnny Peanut, he would give him 50 cents if he held the horse in readiness for him at the stage door that evening. Now Booth was ready. Mr Lincoln also had a busy day. He had office business lined up early in the morning. Then, after breakfast, he had interviews. He met with his cabinet of advisers at 11. After lunch, Lincoln came back to his office eating an apple. Together with a biscuit and a glass of milk, that was his usual noon meal. In the afternoon, Lincoln had more interviews scheduled. Every day, a line of people waited outside the office where Joseph had met Mr. Lincoln. The door to that big square room in the southeast corner of the White House was open to anyone who wanted to see the president, and hundreds of people did. Some people wanted to get their sons out of prison. Some wanted to get out of the army themselves. Some wanted jobs in government. Mr Lincoln patiently listened to all of them and tried to help. It was tiring work. President Lincoln was ready for a break when his driver brought around the barouche for a drive through the park with Mrs Lincoln. The president could relax with his life and talk freely about his fears and dreams. He planned to take her back to Springfield, Illinois, where they'd lived before he was elected. He felt he'd done his work for the country. Mother, he said, I consider that today the war has come to a close. Contentedly, the Lincolns admired the rippling muscles of the handsome matched black horses pulling the barouche. Then the president leaned towards Mary Lincoln. Mary, he said, I have never felt so happy in my life. 
They were almost back to the White House, where the president was to meet informally with some friends from Illinois. These visits were interrupted repeatedly by staff from the War Department. President Lincoln was tuckered out by this time. He was sorry he had agreed to go that night. Then he thought about the notice in the newspaper announcing the Lincoln's attendance at Ford's Theatre. I cannot disappoint the people, the president said. Otherwise, I would not go. Shortly before nine o'clock, the Lincolns left the White House in their carriage. They picked up Clara Harris, the daughter of a senator, and her fiancé, Major Henry Reed Rathbone. The Secretary of War had assigned Major Rathbone to protect the President. Like Joe that morning, the Lincolns were gladdened by the lively crowds celebrating in the streets. They were happy there was such a joyous night for the people of Washington. Chapter 5 Joe was at Ford's Theatre handing out printed sheets to each playgoer. He couldn't help looking past them for the sight of a figure in a stovepipe hat. Would the Lincolns never come? Mr Ford had told him they were coming. The play had begun. The people in the audience were like Joseph. They couldn't settle down because the President was expected. They'd heard a rumour that he would read them dispatches from General Sherman at nine o'clock. Probably about the defeat of General Joseph Johnson, they thought. At last, the President's carriage pulled up to the wooden ramp set up to protect the women's dresses and men's boots from the mud. The audience would not be disappointed, after all. Joseph debated whether to delay President Lincoln's entrance by handing him a program. But then he saw the President smile. He said something to Mrs Lincoln that made her smile and stop in front of Joseph. Joseph offered a sheet to each member of the party. Then he watched them climb the stairs to the presidential box, the special place for the President to sit. Joseph ducked down the aisle to his special place for watching the President bow. The audience was cheering. It was a wonderful moment for Joseph. Every time he heard the orchestra play, Hail to the Chief, he got shivers up his spine. After Mrs Lincoln and Miss Harris took their seats, the President settled down in the comfortable rocking chair kept in the box for him. He sat nearest the audience. Major Rathbone sat somewhat to the rear of the box. Once the presidential party was seated, the play continued. Joe wasn't much interested in whether our American cousin married for love, but he wanted to stay to keep an eye on his hero. He scurried out to the lobby to get Mr Ford's permission. Looking for Mr Ford, Joe was surprised to run into John Wilkes Booth. Joe heard the chief usher say, wonder what he's doing in here. He was in here this afternoon too. Joe also wondered about that. Booth wasn't in the play, but he seemed to be in costume. He'd changed to dark riding breeches, boots and spurs. He carried a black slouch hat. The mare Booth rented was ready at the stage door, although Joseph didn't know that. Poor Johnny Peanut was lying on the stone step, holding its reins. Booth had promised to pay him 50 cents. By the time it was 20 minutes to 10, Booth headed to the right and up the stairs the President had taken a few minutes before. He was moving to, toward the small vestibule behind the presidential box. Booth had planned carefully for this moment. He peered through the hole he'd made in the door to the box. The President was intent on the play. So was Major Rathbone. Booth knew from studying the script that soon there would be only one actor on the stage. This was the moment he had planned for. Slowly, he drew the door of the box open and stepped in. In his right hand, he carried a one-shot Derringer pistol. It was a vest pocket weapon, only weighing eight ounces, but it could kill. In his left hand, Booth brandished a dagger. He had prepared for this moment. After he entered the vestibule, he wedged the door closed so no one could come in after him and stop him. He knew the locks were broken on the boxes. Even so, he would drilled a big enough hole to shoot through if he couldn't get in. The President was sitting forward in his rocker. He was holding Mrs Lincoln's hand. John Wilkes Booth was only four feet away, yet no one had yet noticed him. The Lincolns thought they were protected by the guard at the door. But the guard wasn't at the door. He had left a chat with his friends in the street. Major Rathbone, sent along by the Secretary of War Stanton, was intent on the play. No one was protecting the life of the President. Chapter 6 
Down in the theatre, Joseph wasn't paying any attention as one player after another left the stage. He was watching Lincoln. He didn't know anything about Booth's plan to wait for the stage to clear so he could escape across it. So he didn't get suspicious when he saw a shadowy figure in the back of the box. Was it someone who didn't belong there? It wasn't Major Rathbone. Joe could see him. Joe shivered. Before he could react, the darkness in the box was split by a sudden flash. Instantly, Joe heard the bark of the pistol. Joe couldn't believe his eyes or ears. He saw the president go limp as a rag doll. His head fell forward and then sideways as he slumped over in his rocking chair. Within seconds, Joseph saw John Wilkes Booth in his riding breeches and boots at the front of the box. Now he was no shadowy figure. Instead, he was like a great black bat trying to leap on the stage from between Mrs Lincoln and Miss Harris. He flung himself in the air. He would have landed on his feet. He was an athletic man, but his spur caught in the folds of the flag Mr Ford had draped along the edge of the box that afternoon. Instead of landing on the run, Booth fell to the stage. He had broken his shin bone above the instep of the foot. In spite of the break, he got to his feet. Again he fell. Once more on his feet, he hobbled to the centre of the stage for his last performance. Booth waved his dagger and shouted, Sic Semper Tyrannis. Then he, re he cried, Revenge for the South. Booth wanted the world to know he had killed President Lincoln because he thought the President used his power unjustly. The theatre-goers were confused. Was this part of the performance? All this shooting and shouting? Then they heard a voice yelling, He has shot the President! Booth dashed for the stage door exit. Major Rathbone wounded himself with shouting, Stop him! Stop him! Poor John Peanuts at the stage door never got his promised 50 cents. Booth pushed past him and grabbed the reins. He had a hard time getting his good foot into the stirrup. Finally, he vaulted awkwardly onto the horse. He gave the confused Peanuts a kick in the chest and rode off. So many people ran across the stage after Booth or up the stairs to the President's box that Joseph could no longer see. But he had to find out what was happening to President Lincoln. The playgoers were jammed in the aisles. No one could move. But Joe was used to pressing through crowds. He flattened himself against the wall and squirmed his way out to the front door. He turned down 10th Street to get to the stage door. There, Joseph watched the men carry out the body of the president. He couldn't believe this was the same man he'd seen walk into the theatre just minutes earlier. Some neighbours were shouting to the men carrying the president, This way! Bring him here! Joe recognised Mr Peterson by the light of the candle he held aloft. He lived at what was then numbered 452 10th Street. Joe knew he made uniforms for the army. Joe watched as the men carried Mr Lincoln up a small curving iron stairway into Mr Peterson's home. Then Joe saw the small, sad figure of Mary Lincoln. She followed her husband's body up to a small bedroom under the staircase in Peterson's house. There the President was laid at 10.45pm. He had to be laid diagonally across the bed because it was too short for the president's long body. One by one, the members of the cabinet arrived. Joe recognised them all. He also saw the president's son, Robert. By this time, the police were sending everyone home to clear the streets. The police were afraid of more trouble. They didn't know where Booth was or what other plans he had. When everyone was inside Peterson's house, there was nothing more to be seen. Joe dragged himself home to 376 East Street. He climbed to his room at the top of the house. Tonight, he didn't take one last look out the window to see what was going on. He didn't want to know. He crawled into bed, pulled up the covers, and cried himself to sleep. Chapter 7 Joseph woke at six the next morning. He felt like he was wrapped in a bag of sadness. In his head... He could still see President Lincoln's body being carried into Mr. Peterson's house. Joseph wanted to blot out that picture. He wanted to wipe away the whole day before and start it over. How could the world change so much in 24 hours? His mother shook her head when Joseph said he was going to see how the President was doing. You can't go out on the street, she warned him. No one's allowed out of their houses while the provost guards search the neighbourhood for Booth 
and the people he was in league with. They might be planning some other terrible thing. Joseph checked the street. His mother was right. He could see guards patrolling at the corner. I could go and get some bread for you, Ma. They'd let me through for that. Joseph's mother shook her head. No, the guards already told me if I needed food or medicine, one of them would go for it. You can't get any further than the first patrol. A grown-up couldn't, Joe thought, but a kid's different. What if I never met a patrol? Joe knew there wasn't any guard who knew the neighbourhood as well as he did. He'd just go out the back way and through the neighbours' yards. All around him, April was showing its fresh greenery to Joe. He wasn't aware of anything but the pictures in his head. He saw no blossoms on the fruit trees. He never noticed the sparrows' cheery chirping. Joe's only thought was for Mr Peterson's three-storey house on 10th Street, not really far at all below Joe's house on E Street. A boy like Joe was not going to have any trouble with patrols brought in from other neighbourhoods. When he got close, Joe could see the door to Mr Peterson's tailoring shop in the basement was open. There were still guards around the door, but the crowds that had stood vigil around the house the night before were gone. The guards had pushed them back for several blocks in every direction. No one paid any attention when a small boy slipped into the yard and stationed himself at the rear wall just before seven o'clock that morning of April 15th, 1865. Above him in a border's small rear room, under the stairway, lay the president. Joe hardly breathed. The house where the president lay had drawn him like a magnet. He didn't want a soldier to send him away now before he found out how the president was doing. He tried not to wiggle. He didn't want to miss anything. He kept an eye on the guards. He listened at the open door, even though he was afraid of what he might hear. When he was going through the backyards, the whole world had seemed to be asleep to Joe. But here, at Mr Peterson's house, there was lots to see and hear. After what seemed like a long while to Joseph, he heard someone ask, Mr Secretary, what time is it? The voice belonged to a member of President Lincoln's cabinet, the Surgeon General. The Secretary of War answered, exactly 22 minutes past seven. Only 22 minutes past seven, Joe thought. And then Joseph heard the Surgeon General speak the words he'd feared since he first awoke. Words that would change the course of history in the country. The President is dead. Joseph held his breath. Afraid if his mouth opened, a scream would come out. He could feel the pressure of tears behind his eyes, a hard lump in his chest. Then he heard the Secretary of War speak President Lincoln's epitaph. He belongs to the ages. Joe couldn't believe it. Never again would he see President Lincoln at Ford's Theatre. The President would never know that he, Joseph Hazelton, became a page in the Senate. He would never see Joseph perform on the stage. He would never say, See, I told you you had an actor's voice. President Lincoln didn't belong to the Peace Bill of Washington anymore. He belonged to the ages. Joe stood in Mr Peterson's backyard, shivering. The April warmth left him untouched. The coldness he felt came from inside, from the knowledge that his world was different. All he could hear was a voice repeating, the president is dead. His president. President Lincoln, who'd smiled at him last night. President Lincoln, who thought Joseph had a fine voice and should be an actor. President Lincoln, who had led the country in war and freed the slaves. The president was dead. Joe waited until the guards were looking in the other direction and started home through the backyards. Like everyone else in the neighbourhood, Joseph stayed home for the next three days. Then the blockade was lifted. It was some time before he learned that John Wilkes Booth had escaped briefly to Virginia. Then he was hunted down and shot to death in a barn. Joseph was sorry to hear of Booth's sad end, but it was the death of the president that changed Joseph's life, just as it changed the country's. Joseph knew he would never forget the moment in the Ford Theatre, or any moment he had shared with President Lincoln. He often went over in his mind every detail of every time he had seen and talked to the President. He knew some part of President Lincoln would forever be inside him 
because he loved the president so much. The president, who belonged to the ages, would always belong to Joseph Hazelton in a special way. the end. Thank you and good night.